are. Maybe Bill and Terry are the two witnesses. No, they're not. Maybe Carl and Mimi are the two witnesses. No, they're not. I, I, all right, I'm going to make a serious statement now. No punchline coming. This you're is gonna, serious. You're going to be serious. Yes, really. real serious. I've been in the church since 1971, and in those many years, I have met the two witnesses 17 times. Serious? This, Yeah, seriously, not a joke. Over the years, I have been approached by many people who have told me that they were one of the two witnesses. And as of today, that number is 17. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, not if you're a mental health professional. Seriously, the, the subject of the two w witnesses is really grave information that we find in the Bible. It's part of Bible prophecy. So mm -hmm. I don't want to come across as somebody who doesn't believe that there will be two witnesses or as someone who doesn't believe in Bible prophecy. We really believe this stuff on SOS. But I'm just one of the few guys out there who says, I believe in prophecy, but we've got to stop turning Bible prophecy into a religious caricature by saying that the end is going to come in the next three to five years or the next 10 years or in our lifetime. The guys who say this stuff or imply this stuff are either charlatans or kooks. Now, we do believe in Bible prophecy very much. That's right. The problem is that, unfortunately, the headline theology people have twisted God's prophecies that he put into his holy word. These headline theology people will tell you all kind of nonsense about the two witnesses and other end time events. But guess what? Most of the time, they just don't know what they're talking about. And it's important that those who teach the Bible not try to artificially or incorrectly attach some prophetic prophetic event to today's news. Like, uh, here are a couple broadcasts that were recently put out by one church organization. One title of one of their broadcasts was, Are We Living in the Time of the End? And naturally, in the broadcast, they did not say no, because they want their listeners to think that the answer is yes. Then another broadcast title was The Four Horsemen of the Book of Revelation. As Mr. Rogers would say, can you spell fear religion? Then these guys tell us that the time of Jacob's troubles are imminent. And they spend so many of their resources on this end time malarkey instead of focusing upon the redemptive qualities of Jesus and the example that he set for us to live our lives by. Instead of this good stuff, redemptive qualities, example of Jesus, instead of the good stuff, it's all this gloom and doom. And my question is this, instead of your promoting end time speculative nonsense, 
How about if you teach the gospel of peace? Yes, the gospel of peace. This phrase is actually in the Bible, but a lot of people don't know. Let me read, let me read it, there are two examples of the gospel of peace in the Bible, because I'm pretty sure some of you out there have never heard this preached from the pulpit in your church. Romans 10, 15 says, and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Ephesians 6.15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, um, I was going to read a thing that uh, Comment Lee... Comment from Lee? Huh? Comment from Lee? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pull it up on my phone. Okay. I was going to read... Well, why don't you read it? You, you've uh, got Lee's comment. We had a thing that uh, Lee had written into us about um, uh, preaching the gospel, and we're going to read it tonight, but we're not because he... Lee, you made a mistake. You sent something into the chat room tonight. It's more timely. So Nancy's going to read this one instead. So we're not going to do your gospel thing tonight. Read what Lee Lisman writes uh, to us tonight, please. Okay. The gospel of peace ties in with what Paul called the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 reads, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have um, access by faith into grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The churches of God have historically, con and that's the end of the quote. The churches of God have historically confused the good news of the, of a coming uh, messianic kingdom, aka the wonderful world tomorrow, with the good news of entering the existing kingdom of God that always has and always will exist. It's the kingdom that Matthew, in writing to the Jews, called the kingdom of heaven. The good news for us today, right now, is that uh, through faith, sorry, had something in my way. Uh, let's see, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and His grace, we are at peace with our Father in heaven as His children, and will enter that eternal spiritual realm when we are changed by Christ at Christ's coming. It is a gospel of peace. Yeah, and how often do these uh, headline theology doom and gloom preachers quote? Romans 10.15 and Ephesians 6.15 that we just read. I don't know that I've ever heard them quote these scriptures. Instead, instead of talking about the gospel of peace, they'd rather scare you by telling you that the Germans are going to come to the United States and kill one-third of us and take another third of us as captives back to Germany, and then they wonder why nobody wants to listen to their message on their websites. Or go to Germany. Or go to Germany. Let's see if we can get your blood pressure down just okay. a little bit, okay. baby. I, I hope that these things that we say don't bother you too much. You know, SOS is not for the faint of heart. So make sure that you always have your defibrillator close by when you watch the show. Defibrillator? We're, we're not that bad. Sometimes we do end up enjoying ourselves too much on the show. Sometimes? Anyway. Okay. All right. Another topic. Hey, I hope everyone is getting ready for the Lord's Supper Passover. That's right. It's coming up pretty soon. And you know what? I, I needed to backtrack on one thing. I wanted okay. to mention you were talking about the two witnesses. Yeah. Uh, Richard Maxwell says that uh, they, he, he said, we believe the two witnesses are the New and Old Testaments. Ah, okay. This is from a Seventh-day Adventist point of view, I think. I think so. Yeah, okay. Very good, Richard. Thank right. you so much. All right, so okay. we're talking about now Passover, which is coming up real soon. Passover, Lord's Supper. And I think next week, if I remember, um, I want to talk about this business of, uh, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, about uh, taking the uh, Lord's Supper unworthily. We need to talk about that. That's a real key understanding for Christians as we go into the spring and as we get ready for the um, uh, the Lord's Supper or Passover. Okay. Um, and uh, Nancy says it's coming up pretty soon, and I say, yeah, pretty soon. Well, maybe, maybe not, depending on which calendar that you follow. You know, you had to bring up calendars, didn't you? We're going to have a calendar fight going on in the chat room tonight. <laughs> Ain't it funny how things work out sometimes? Uh, what in the world is that? Oh, it's, it's a graphic. I want to start using when we say something funny. Wow, look at us. We're, we got moving graphics Yeah, now. moving graphics, yeah. Okay. All right, some of the stuff Wes comes up with, though. Can we get serious now? Yeah, sure. All right, uh, now, Wes, are you really going to talk about President Trump's meeting with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un in your segment tonight? That sounds very political. I'm glad you asked, because, you know, I don't take sides in politics. 
And just like any time I tackle a current events topic, it never goes in the direction that everybody thinks it's going to go. Uh, you're does. correct. So many times people think you're going to preach something, then you throw them a curveball. Mm -hmm. You have this knack for keeping people kind of off balance. Uh, can you give us a short preview of what you're going to talk about later then? Well, no, but, I, but I'm glad you asked the question because I want to set the stage so that later on, well, when we do talk about President uh, uh, Trump and Kim Jong Un in a meeting, everyone will be prepared for that segment. Okay. Set the stage like how? Well, first of all, a lot of people who have seen pictures from the summit, they've noticed that the Korean dictator has put on some pounds. No, wait, 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 wait. I hope you're not going to comment about people gaining weight because that is no, not nice. No, of course not. We don't make jokes about people putting on weight. That would be rude. I'm only pointing out that sometimes when people are hurting, they eat to cover for their pain. Mm, that's a true statement. And you're suggesting that Kim Jong-un is hurting because of something going on in his personal life? That's exactly right. According to sources, Kim Jong-un has been emotionally eating since Dennis Rodman was spotted on a date with another dictator. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you think that information is going to get uh, help people get prepared for the topic in your segment? Absolutely. Here's some more information. When Kim uh, Young un met with President Trump this past week, it was the dictator's first public appearance in over 40 days. But then after the great leader of North Korea came out and saw his shadow, that now means we're going to have another 60 more years of nuclear winter. Oh, man, I don't think this information is helpful at all. During the North Korean dictator's long absence from the public, he even missed a major uh, national ceremony. This was several weeks ago. The ceremony marked the 69th anniversary of the founding of North Korea. Korea watchers say this was especially strange because he knew cake would be there. Oh, man, can we please move on? No. You know, Kim Jong-un is uh, the leader of a very unstable peninsula in Eastern Asia. And President Trump knows how to deal with unstable peninsulas. He does. Why, why do you say that? Because we have an unstable peninsula here in the United States. It's called Florida. <laughs> oh, man. I hope you realize that uh, all our viewers from Florida have just turned off the program. Nah, they, they've got a great sense of humor down there. All right. Well, that's it. We're moving on. Okay. It's time for a couple of quick hellos. I'd like to do a shout out to two folks who we know are not the two witnesses. Are, Carl you, and me. are you sure they're not the two witnesses? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Maybe they live on an unstable peninsula. No. Carl is in North Carolina and Mimi is in Vancouver, British Columbia. And Carl is the genius webmaster of our two websites, rldea.com and dynamicchristianministries.org. Carl also connects the SOS feed to YouTube. Yes. So big howdy to two of our great technical people, Carl and Mimi. Okay. Oh, and we've got another um, big um, uh, Texas howdy to two more people who might be the two witnesses. No. no? What's this talking about? Bill and Terry Lusenheide in Southern California. Bill is so mad at you for talking about Germany and Germans <laughs> that way. He reminded everybody that my maiden name was Schmidt. Yes. So, um, anyway, but they're not the two witnesses. You're sure? I'm positive. Okay. And, and, and uh, let me just throw an aside. Bill is a German. Nancy's a, a German. Uh, Carl Lusenheide is a German. Carl Nachtrieb. Carl, uh, I'm sorry. Carl Nachtrieb is a German. I am surrounded by good German people. Okay. And, and you're saying that um, uh, Terry and Bill are not no, the two witnesses. No, they're not the two witnesses. Well, you're going to feel real funny if it turns out that they are. Well, we'll deal with that topic later. You always say that, but we never do. You know, Terry's the one who makes sure that Bill comes up with a great segment every week. And then she connects Bill to our live feed. You know, this is all so complicated, and I am so confused. Well, thank you for your expertise and hard work, Bill and Terry. Who, I am told, are not uh, the two witnesses from an unstable peninsula. Okay. We have a quick reminder. Please remember that Wes is going to start giving a sermon once a month. You can watch the sermon in the same places you watch SOS. My first sermon will not be tomorrow, but it'll be one week from tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, here um, on uh, dynamicchristianministries.org and rldea.com. And Facebook and YouTube. And Facebook and YouTube. And you can watch the sermon by connecting in the exact same way that you connect to SOS every Friday night. All right, well, tonight we've got a great show for you. Bill is going to talk about Jesus and the Sabbath. Nancy's going to talk about lessons from Elizabeth and Mary. Queen Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, and Wes is going to talk about why the U.S. Korean summit was held in Vietnam. So stick around. Get your defibrillator ready.
stick around because we're going to have lots of fun tonight. And let's open with prayer. But first, I want to mention something about prayer real quick. Seriously, we received prayer requests this week from both India and Pakistan. They have uh, emailed me and texted me. The folks over there living, uh, especially those close to the border of India and Pakistan, they're really concerned about the conflict that's going on over their border these days. It's up near Kashmir. And this is disconcerting because both of these nations are nuclear powers. And when two countries are nuclear powers, some starts out small, it could escalate into nuclear weapons being used. And we don't bring this up to scare you. You already know that on SOS we don't promote fear religion or scare religion. And, and sure, we know that the Bible says wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. So we encourage you not to scoff at the evidence of God and, and his commands and his Bible. So we do teach fear. Okay. But when it comes to world events, we are not going to try and scare you by reading you a news article about India and Pakistan and then try to tie it in with some end time prophecy. So you get scared, join our church, which we don't have one, nope. and send us your money. Because that's what so many of, church, of these churches do. So when we ask for your prayers about India and Pakistan, please don't think we're trying to use that situation to benefit our ministry. Uh, our mentioning this is simply a prayer that God intervenes so, and be merciful so that innocent people don't have to suffer because of bad decisions made by their nation's leaders. Well, great point. So let's go ahead and pray. Okay. Our Father in heaven, uh, your Sabbath is wonderful, and we thank you so much for it. We thank you that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and we thank you so much that he sits at your right hand and intervenes for us on a daily basis so that when we sin, we know we have Jesus advocating for us, rooting for us so that we'll overcome sin, repent, and do better. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to be with uh, your obedient ones around the world as we keep the Sabbath. Please be with us on this show tonight. Help us to have a good heart. Help us to let our light shine so that we might glorify you. Not just me and Nancy, but everybody in the chat room. Help everybody to comport themselves with Christian love. Please be with us on this whole thing. We ask for your help with the technical, which uh, gives us so many problems. And we ask for your presence. We give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, we did hear that uh, people have said that the sound is good tonight, so we are appreciative of that. Wonderful. Um, and uh, Carl says he is not German. Oh, Nachtrieb is not German? Uh, no, oh. he didn't say what he was. What he are you, Carl? Okay, let's, let's take a commercial break. We'll be right back. I guess the computer didn't hear me. Let's take a commercial break. We'll be right back. The final day of Jesus' human life as a mortal 2,000 years ago, there was somewhat of a tug of war regarding Jesus' fate. This dispute was between the Romans and the Jewish leaders of his time. It was clear that the Roman procurator Pilate wanted the Jews to be in charge of killing Jesus, while the Jewish leaders wanted the Romans to execute him. It's important to note that the Romans had to be the ones to execute Jesus rather than the Jews. Why is that? Wouldn't Jesus' death have been just as real and just as final, no matter which of the two groups killed him? After all, either way Jesus would have died for our sins. Another point, Pilate had Jesus scourged. This act of Jesus being painfully humiliated was actually quite necessary. Why? At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a message that goes into detail about the importance of Jesus not just dying. This message shows how Jesus also had to suffer, both physically and mentally. The title of this message is, Discern the Lord's Body. You can find it on the audio recordings tab of our website, rldea.com. This message is free. Again, the title is, Discern the Lord's Body, at rldea.com. Let's get into our first segment tonight. What have you got for us this evening, sweetheart? Well, recently, Wes and I saw a movie called Mary, Queen of Scots, based on John Guy's bi biography titled Queen of Scots, The True Life of Mary Stewart. We both enjoyed the movie, but I'm not sure how realistic it was. It was one of those based-on-a-true-story films, although I think the book is accurate. But I learned some things from the relationship between Mary, Queen of Scots and Queen Elizabeth I of England. Some things about how not to treat each other, especially those who are destined to rule. I learned some things about how not to act as someone who will someday be a queen, king, or high priest in the kingdom of God. 
and I'd like to share these things with you this evening. Point one is this, jealousy separates. Each one of these women's, women had a right to the throne that she sat on. Mary's son, in fact, also had a claim to the throne of England, and he did become Queen Elizabeth's heir. This man, Mary's son, would be James I, who gave us the King James translation of the Bible. History tells us, though, that Elizabeth I felt very insecure when it came to her hold on the crown. This caused the English queen to be jealous and even wary of the Scottish queen. Our lesson is, <coughs> don't let jealousy separate you from a brother or sister. Your eternal future is secure. When Jesus returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you too will be crowned. The fact that every other faithful child of God who has ever lived will also receive a crown does not in any way take away from your own crown or reward. Further, your future reward is in your own hands. Your future reward has nothing to do with what you rule now. Instead, it has everything to do with how you rule over what you are given. This is a lesson of the parable of talents in Matthew 25. It's here that we find the same commendation for the servant who received five talents, which he turned into ten, as we do for the servant who received two talents and turned it into four. Both Matthew chapter 25 verse 21 and chapter 25 verse 23 say this. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Rich or poor now, old or young when you accepted Jesus and gave your life to him, many talents or few, healthy or sickly, no matter, God will judge you only on the talents and opportunities he has given to you and not on those he has given to others. Rest assured that you have a rightful claim to your crown and so do all your brothers and sisters in Christ. There is nothing for you to be jealous of, either from an earthly or from an internal standpoint. Jealousy keeps us from esteeming others better than ourselves, as we are told to do in Philippians 2.3. That's Philippians 2.3. Jealousy keeps us from following what we read in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 25 and verse 26 as well. 1 Corinthians 12.25-26 that the members may have the same care one for another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Don't let jealousy keep you from rejoicing in the victory of fellow members. Don't let jealousy separate you from fellowship with others. Jealousy of others robs you of your joy today and puts the, your future in the kingdom at risk. At risk. Lesson two, or point two is, Fear separates. Because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins and Elizabeth had no heir, nor did she ever intend to have one, they could have negotiated a truce based on Elizabeth naming Mary's son James as the heir to her throne while Mary was still alive. But Mary was Catholic and Elizabeth was Protestant, and each one feared the power of the other's church and its passionate followers. Our lesson? Don't let fear of another person's power or religion become a basis for how you treat that person. Don't let fear make you hard-hearted. We're meant to be compassionate toward all our brethren, <clears throat> no matter how they actually treat us, let alone how we might fear they will treat us in the future. Don't let newspapers, magazines, talk show hosts, TV shows, Fox News, CNN, or any other news show, or memes on Facebook make you fearful of the times we live in or the people around us. Fear is bad for your faith. What happens when we let fear of others enter our lives? Well, first of all, we don't talk to them about Jesus. We don't feed them or clothe them. We don't let our light shine. We turn into crabby Christians, and that's not good for us. Maybe you're tired of me quoting the following scriptures, but I'm doing it anyway. Luke 6, 27 through 28, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. And Romans 12, 20, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Point three, greed for power separates. Truthfully, in the case of Elizabeth and Mary, the men in power, 
their advisors and spiritual leaders for each of them. Those men who were supposed to help them to be fully informed and to rule well were more of a threat to each queen than the queens were to each other. These so-called advisors, and sometimes these men were actually their family, plotted to take power, to dethrone the queen, actually take over the throne by marrying her to some man who would listen to them. Our lesson is, don't let anyone else's agenda cause you to have an adversarial relationship with your brother or sister in Christ. Don't let another person's bid for power or position or leadership separate you from them or from others in the faith. Don't let your own desire for power or position or leadership separate you from your brother in Christ. Don't let another person tell you that you must choose sides in their own struggle. Don't ask others to choose sides with you. Don't let another person tell you that you must protect your own position at church or help them protect theirs. I've been tripped up by this before to my own public humiliation. And I have promised God I will walk away from any position, power, or project rather than let it separate me from my brother or sister in Christ. These are the things that church splits are made of, brethren, most of the time. Struggles for power and position. Matthew 5.38 says, we'll start in 38. Uh, you have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slap you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. And verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Between the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders of his day, Jesus, our Messiah and Savior, was ultimately stripped of everything down to his clothing, his dignity, and his life. He went like a sheep to the slaughter. He willingly gave it all up. Nothing we feel we have a right to, nothing we feel we have earned, nothing we feel we are due is worth conflict with your brothers in Christ. I should be willing to relinquish it all. I know it isn't easy, but this is what's required of us. One final lesson from Elizabeth and Mary, and now we're talking about a different Elizabeth and a different Mary. We're talking about two women who lived 2,000 years ago. This lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, where we learn that Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with the son who would be called John the Baptist, the son who someday would cry in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. In this Luke account, Mary, newly pregnant with Jesus and Messiah, went to see her cousin Elizabeth. Let's look in, uh, start in Luke 1, starting in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed in a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Verse 44, But behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And final verse 45, And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Instead of jealousy, or giving in to fear, or struggling who'd have the greatest power, these cousins supported one another. They praised one another. They rejoiced together in what the Lord had done for each of them and what through their respective sons the Father was going to do for all of us. Let's be like these, like these two future queens. Let's be like a, this Elizabeth and this Mary, brethren. Let's not let greed for power, let's not let fear, let's not let jealousy separate us. I welcome your thoughts and your comments and questions as well. You can write me right now in the chat room or email me anytime at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org.
Wasn't that clever how Nancy talked about uh, Elizabeth and Mary, and then she talked about Elizabeth and Mary? Mm -hmm. I never would have thought of doing something like that. In the uh, chat room, Amy Hohart says, jealousy is such a waste of time. Is it ever a waste of That's time? True. Okay, um, let's see. I think we're ready to move on to our next segment, which is going to be Wild Bill coming on. Uh, we're about to bring Bill on for his segment, and you don't want to miss that. And remember that Bill runs the Facebook uh, page, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers has over 26,000 followers. And for all I know, it could have hit 27,000 this week. I don't know. They're adding like something, like what, 300 people a week. So please check Great it out. Job. Great uh, job. And now let's see if I can bring on my good buddy Bill onto the show. And let's see if Wes can press some buttons correctly here. Okay, let's try this. Well, good evening, Wes and Nancy. Happy Sabbath, Bill and Terry. Hey. Um, broadcasting from beautiful Southern California. Is California's unstable peninsula like Cal uh, well, Florida? In some ways, California is actually worse than Florida. In what way? Well, in California, by the age of 30, most women have more plastic than your Honda. Oh, ouch. What have you got for us tonight, Bill? <laughs> hey, let's talk about Jesus on the Sabbath. <laughs> Recently on my Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers Facebook page, I had a little fun and I posted a picture of the game show, Family Feud. The hypothetical question that was asked to the contestants was, name an excuse that Christians use to break the Fourth Commandment. And the answers that people gave at uh, Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers were various classical ones like, it was made for the Jews, or it was done away with at the cross, or every day is now the Sabbath day or Jesus is just my Sabbath, or I have to work, and many more of the classic uh, responses that you probably have seen over the years against the Sabbath commandment. But, well, how did Jesus himself deal with the Sabbath commandment? You know, after his baptism and his 40-day fast and his temptation by the devil, Jesus was ready to begin his ministry. And what was the first thing he did? It might indicate something. Where did he go? And what day did he do it on? And the Bible says this in Luke 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into, unto Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And when he came to Nazareth, and he was brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So this wasn't just the first time, it was as his custom was. And he stood up to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it to again the minister who sat down. And all the eyes were upon him that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, onto him fastened onto him, looking at him. And he began to say to them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And what day was it? Well, it was the Sabbath day, of course. And it was part of Jesus' customary practice to attend synagogue on the Sabbath day. And it was on the Sabbath day that Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. Okay, Jesus was keeping the Sabbath up to this point. But was it his intent to later on change the day of worship for his disciples? Now, this kind of change could not have been an afterthought. For if it were part of the plan, Jesus knew that from the beginning. He knew it, he knew it when he read Isaiah in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So was it his intent to change the fourth commandment or even to abolish it? And if so, how would have the intent been finally expressed or carried out? And what would have been the consequences if that was the change, if that's what had happened at that time? Now first, it would, would have been necessary at some point for Jesus to clearly and definitively announce a change of Sabbath day and to give the reason for it. And remember, in that culture at that time, that changing the Sabbath would have been tantamount to changing God's. That's how important the Sabbath would have been. 
this was no mere doctrinal issue, some fringe issue. This was a very foundational issue to the Jewish religion. And all of uh, Jesus' disciples were Jews themselves. And like Jesus, they had been brought up in the synagogue, and the Sabbath was a very part of their being. They would never imagine they had the authority to change the Sabbath without Jesus' explicit authorization. And furthermore, it, it, if it had been Jesus' intent to change the Sabbath to Sunday, there would have been a point in time for the changeover. There would have been the recognition that the change had been made and why it had been made. And that's just not something you sort of slip into gradually, right? It's like, well, this week Saturday, but next week Sunday, maybe we'll go back to Saturday. It's it's, it's an either or or, or uh, proposition, okay? Now bear in mind that for some 20 years after the ascension of Christ, the church was composed entirely of Jews and proselytes. There was no wholesale conversion of the Gentiles till Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey way over in Acts 13. Okay, again, about 20 years into the, the uh, New Testament era. And you can search the four Gospels and all the way up to Acts 12, and you're not going to find a single word of controversy over the Sabbath. There might have been some other issues going on, but, but not that. And you will find no instructions to change the day of worship, nor even breadcrumbs to allow you to indicate that such a change had been made or was even being contemplated. You're just not going to find that kind of evidence. And that's important because a change in the day of worship would not merely imply a change in custom. For every Jew and every proselyte, it would have implied a change of God. And this change would have been dealt with in death. Now you tell me, could had such a change in the first 20 years of the church been made without a ripple of it showing up in the Bible up to Acts 13? I just refuse to believe that. Now, I recognize that, that perhaps that's an argument from silence, but an argument from silence is decisive if it can be shown that the silence is significant. In this case, it is. This silence is highly significant. Now, it's true that the early church suffered persecution for its beliefs in Christ. Yet, nowhere do you see in the New Testament that the church was being persecuted by the Jews because they had changed the Sabbath day to Sunday. Paul wasn't going around and rounding up Christians because of that. It was never an accusation made that they were breaking the Sabbath day. It's because they were following Christ and his teachings, which at that point did not indicate anything about keeping Sunday. There is no evidence or testimony that the church was ever accused of by the Jews for not being Sabbath keepers. There's really no question that the entire New Testament church throughout the period uh, in which our New Testament was being written observe the Sabbath on the day that we call Saturday. Just no question about it. There's no question that the visible ch church changed their day of worship to Sunday well after the last of the apostles were dead, many, many years later. The question we must answer is whether the change was somehow authorized or whether it was unjustified and unwarranted. And so the next question is, what must modern man do about the Sabbath once he learns what's it all about? So let me make a suggestion. Take your Bible in hand and read the fourth commandment over in Exodus 20, verses 8 uh, through 11. And pray and ask God to help you incorporate the Sabbath into your life. And as much as possible, step outside of your ordinary work and require that no one else works on your behalf. In other words, give all the people for whom you're responsible the day off. Using the Sabbath day for rest and recuperation. And sleep late a little bit on Saturday. Don't sleep in until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You need to get up, you need to go to church. But spend some extra time with your Bible. Do some Bible study. Do some Bible reading. Spend extra time with your family. Take some time to think about life and what God might have in mind for you. Don't allow yourself to, to feel overly restricted by the Sabbath. It's, it's a joy. But let's stay away from the carnal things of, of the day-to-day -day living. Certainly not what God wants for us on a Sabbath day. To hold the day apart wholly for God. After all, it's his day, the day that reminds us who God really is. And a memorial to his great creation that he made as well. And one more thing. Don't forsake the assembling together with other believers of like mind. 
And though we love having you here every single Friday night on the start of Sabbath, it's not a substitute for church. And some people try to do that, try to use start of Sabbath for church. Don't do that. And as always, we here at Star Sabbath encourage you to attend a healthy Sabbatarian church of your choosing. All right? Yeah. Have a great Sabbath. Are you a humanitarian or a humanist? If you mean this to be someone who honors mankind, this label could be a compliment. But there's more than just one definition of humanism. Another definition of humanism goes something like this. Humanism is the denial of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Humanism says that man's success or failure lies solely with the perfection without God. This definition is in stark contrast to the teachings of Jesus, where he said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, how far does Jesus' statement go? Does this mean you can't even put on your socks without Jesus? At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a message that explains so much regarding this subject. In this sermon, Ron Dart talks about where you should draw the line between relying on God and relying on yourself. We need to understand these things because no person can do it alone. Like it or not, we all need the God of the Bible in our lives. The title of this message is Humanism. You can find it on the audio recordings tab of our website, rldea.com. This message is free. Again, the title is Humanism at rldea.com. I'd like to begin our third segment tonight by talking about this week's summit between the United States and North Korea. Sweetie, it, you're still on the... Oh, 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 thank you, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it again. All right. All right. One, one more time. This is what happens when there's only two people in the studio. <laughs> okay. All right. Live TV, folks. Yeah. Second, second take. Okay. I'd like to begin our third segment tonight by talking about this week's summit between the United States and North Korea. It was held in, of all places, North Vietnam. Now, North Korea is basically a failed nation state. Its economy is in total shambles. Human rights are non-existent. The citizens over there are almost totally isolated from the rest of the world. And the health of the people in North Korea is measurably deficient. The average North Korean is a full two inches shorter than his South Korean counterpart. This is attributed to the poverty in the North. One estimate is that six million citizens in North Korea do not get sufficient food and one third of North Korean children have chronic malnutrition. Now, let's be a little graphic here and a little bit funny too. Let's talk about national leaders. And I'm gonna be real frank and not try to whitewash any leader for any reason. It's almost always a fact that if you're the leader of a country, you're gonna do everything you can to make people inside and outside your country believe that you are the most healthy specimen of a man possible. This is what these guys do. This has been going on all throughout history. U.S. presidents have been doing it for decades. An exception might be William Howard Taft uh, because he was, he never pretended to be in great health. I, uh, there's an apocryphal story that he got stuck in a bathtub. Taft was in really bad health. He never pretended to be in tip-top physical condition, condition. But just about every other president, including the current occupant of the White House, has tried to spin the news about their physical health. They want you to believe that they're in the prime of their life and they're in perfect shape. And what's amazing is I've seen this in leaders of the Sabbath-keeping churches. They try to act like they're in perfect health, and they're not. And, and they should be humble and say, yeah, I'm not a great physical specimen. Or if they've got health issues, they should bring them to the brethren and say, look, I've got this health problem. I need your prayers. But they won't. Again, this is a practice of many leaders in the church and out of the church who want to project a false image of strength. Kim Jong-un, the dictator of North Korea, carries this way too far. Wherever he travels, his assistants always bring him a special portable toilet just for him. He will not use just any restroom. Now, why is that? Some have asked, well, is it because he's too good to use a regular toilet? 
Nope. Many North Korea watchers claim it's because he is in really bad health. And inside sources say that Kim Jong-un has high blood pressure and diabetes and a couple of other diseases, which the North Koreans deny. They say he's in perfect health. And the truth of the matter could be resolved by examining one of his stools. Okay, now don't get offended that I bring this nasty topic up because in the chat room, y'all are making jokes about sitting on the throne. So don't get all self-righteous on me. The leaders of, of North Korea are terrified that someone someday might get a hold of one of the great leader's stools because if scientists examined it, they'd find out that he has all kinds of illnesses. A laboratory can learn so much about a person's health by examining, and I'm not going to say the word again because it's already too disgusting. So when Kim Jong-un travels, he only goes to the john in one of his own portable North Korean toilets that gets carried around wherever he goes, no matter where he goes. Again, <laughs> this is not some kind of a fetish or weird weirdness on the dictator's part. It's all very practical. From a political point of view, it makes perfect sense. It's all part of, of, of his image, which he protects so vigorously. Now, let's ask the question. Why is it that the summit between the United States president and the Korean dictator ended up taking place in Vietnam, where they had to lug a couple of special, you know, fancy portable toilets for the dictator of North Vietnam. Why Vietnam? On paper, Vietnam is a communist country. It's, it's in no way a neutral country. In the very heart of Hanoi, the Vietnam capital city, there's a huge statue of Lenin. It turns out that the Americans were the ones who were really pushing for a summit to be in Vietnam. Why? Well, let's look at the history of Vietnam. Wes is going to talk about history. Who, so who would have imagined that? Yeah. Okay. History is important. Okay. One of the things we should remember is that during the lifetimes of many of you out there watching this show, the capital of Vietnam, Hanoi, was being bombed, heavily bombed. It was the desire of Presidents Johnson and Nixon to bomb Hanoi back to the Stone Age in an attempt to win the war between America and Vietnam. But after 20 years of war, almost 20 years, the Americans finally admitted defeat. They lost the war. They had to retreat from the country. In the end, 3 million Vietnamese died during those 20 years of war. Many cities in Vietnam lay in ruins. Their agricultural fields were soaked with herbicides, you know, that ancient orange thing. Their forests were littered with unexploded bombs. Now, today, 40 years later, where are the two countries, the United States and Vietnam, when it comes to their relationship? After the war ended, did they get mad at each other and stay mad even up to this day? No. These two countries are now friends. That's right, good friends. Here's just one example. Right now, when Americans go to Vietnam, they're greeted by Vietnamese citizens who want to practice their English on Americans, or the Vietnamese want to ask Americans about Christianity. It is really difficult to find any rancor for America among the Vietnamese government or her people. These people really like America. One of the most popular restaurants in Hanoi is McDonald's. They love our rock and roll. They're really curious about our Christianity. Vietnam has embraced a form of capitalism that's constantly raising the standard of living for its people. Its city streets went from being crammed with bicycle commuters back in the 50s and 60s to being crammed with motorcycle commuters in the 80s and 90s, and then they uh, progressed to being crammed with cars. All of this in just a few decades. Economically, Vietnam has progressed by leaps and bounds following the end of the war with the United States. And here is a common phrase in Vietnam today. Listen to this phrase. It's a great one. History is for us to learn from, not to hold grudges. Can I say that again? That's Please not from do. the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not from the Bible, but I'm going to say it again. History is for us to learn from, not to hold grudges. This is a phrase that ought to be uttered by a lot of Christians that I know. But let's not go there just yet. We'll get there. We'll go to that point. 
This attitude of forgiveness is why so many nations in the world wanted this summit to be held in Vietnam. It wasn't just the Americans. Other countries wanted it there. The Vietnamese in particular want the Koreans to see what can happen after you make peace and forgive and rejoin the family of nations. Again, I find it astounding that this atheistic nation of Vietnam shows such an incredible ability to forgive. This is an amazing success story. All right, let's bring this just a little bit closer to home. Let's, let's go back to America. Back in 2006, five murders were committed by a crazed gunman in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. It was at the West Nickel Mine School, which was a one-room Amish schoolhouse that had one teacher and several dozen young Amish girls there. Some guy walked into this one-room schoolhouse and shot 10 Amish girls. Five of them died. After the murder, the gunman killed himself with his own gun. This was a horrible thing for a lone gunman to do to these little girls who were part of perhaps the most peaceful and loving religion in the world, the Amish. They're pacifists. They, if you hit them, they won't hit you back. They're just peaceful and loving. Needless to say, the world was horrified by this violent crime. The local people in Lancaster County, both Amish and non-Amish, mourned the loss of these five innocent girls that died. Not surprisingly, this act of murder was universally vilified as it should have been. These, these shootings were nothing less than heinous. But then something interesting happened. This was shortly after the murders, within hours, it was the Amish reaction to the murderer. And this reaction shocked the world and it shamed many people who professed to be Christians. A grandfather of one of the mur murdered Amish girls told relatives, he said, there should be no hatred for the murderer who had committed this horrible act. He said, we are Christians, there is to be no hatred. Then one of the Amish people contacted the family of the murderer. The Amish knew that this man's family was also suffering just like they were and they considered it their Christian duty to comfort the relatives of the murderer. It's reported that one Amish man held the sobbing father of the murderer for an hour in an attempt to help him through his grief. The Amish then set up a charitable fund for the family of the man. About 30 Amish attended the funeral of the killer for the purpose of comforting his family. They served as pallbearers for the murderer's coffin. Even though the Amish condemned that act of murder, they still made it clear that they would not speak evil of the murderer. They said that as followers of Jesus, their only choice was to administer quick and complete forgiveness for the sin. Let me repeat that. They said that as followers of Jesus, their only choice was to administer quick and complete forgiveness for the sin. What an example of Christianity. And here's what I find amazing about so many Christians. One of the quickest ways that you can make a Christian angry is for you to tell him that he has to forgive someone for some dastardly thing that's been done to him. The number of excuses that Christians give for not forgiving is endless. It's like Bill asked for a list of excuses for not keeping the Sabbath by Christians. The list goes on and on. Christians are the same way when it comes to not forgiving. A, a person will say, say something like this, well, I'm not ready to forgive. Or, or that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Or how about if he forgives me first, then maybe I'll forgive him. Or, or this one. I will forgive that person after he apologizes because there must be repentance before there can be forgiveness. At this time, at this moment today, as we do the show, the West Nickel Mine School is no longer there. It's been torn down. It's just a field now. I was up there a few years ago and uh, went by there and, and filmed a segment of a show up there. But the memory of the Christian love that followed a horrific crime will remain forever. And I ask you, if these folks can forgive the way that they did after five murders, can you forgive things that have been done to you that are probably far less heinous? I mean, the Passover slash Lord's Supper is coming up. 
shouldn't you be asking this question? Am I holding some kind of a grudge that I need to give up on? And I hope you'll give up on it because Jesus said, if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. And remember, even at the moment that Jesus was being crucified, he asked his heavenly father to forgive those who were in the process of killing him. Jesus put no conditions on that forgiveness. He didn't ask for their forgiveness after they repented. He gave them total unconditional forgiveness. All right, I'm seeing some lights coming on. Are we still broadcasting? Yes. Okay. I think so. All right, well, I'm going to go on faith. Let's come a little further, even closer to home. Let's talk about Sabbath keeping history because we're about to get, oh, good, we're only at 10 o'clock, all right. Um, nine. Or nine o'clock. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Ten on the east five, coast. five to nine, okay. Let's talk about Sabbath keeping history because here's where the rubber meets the road for a lot of you Sabbath keepers out there. I'd like to relate something from the history of the Church of God Seventh Day. That group formally came into existence around the time of the American Civil War. Later, around 1933, uh, that group split into two rival church groups. One group was headquartered at Stanbury, Missouri. The other group was headquartered at Salem, West Virginia. Now question, this is a little aside. Who do you think caused this split? And, and the answer shouldn't surprise most of you out there. The people who caused this split were the church leaders. The ministry, surprise, surprise. Back in 1933, their problem was all about money and power and control. Imagine Christian ministers being that way. All right, what's interesting about this 1933 split is that we asked this question, how did the brethren of the Church of God Seventh Day respond when the church leaders broke the organization into two groups? Well, initially, the brethren said, well, all right, I guess they're the leaders and we're going to support them. But as the brethren started asking questions and understanding things better, a lot of the brethren eventually came to this conclusion. They said this, this split was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. It's not something that benefits the flock. This split only benefits some of the leaders. So a big, big chunk of the brethren ignored the leaders. They refused to follow them. And how did they do this? Well, they did this by maintaining friendships across party lines. Individuals from one organization visited churches from the other organization. The brethren made it known loud and clear that they were against the split. The brethren maintained that they were not going to support it. And the brethren adamantly insisted that this problem be corrected by the leaders. And guess what happened? The big majority of leaders recognized which way the wind was blowing, and as a result, the leaders hurried up and they jumped in front of the reconciliation parade so that they could act like they were the ones leading it. And by 1949, the breach was, for the most part, healed. The two groups were back together and love was increased. And that's the most important thing in all this, that love was increased. The Church of God Seventh-day Reconciliation Incident is a great example of brethren not allowing leaders to do the, right, do the wrong thing when they were doing the wrong thing. In this case, the leaders were not showing love, so the brethren ignored the bad example of the leaders. All right, let's get back to Vietnam. Right now, when it comes to evangelism in many Sabbath-keeping churches, we're like Vietnam was back in the 50s and 60s when their people in their cities were commuting on bicycles. So many of our evangelistic efforts are pitiful. They're the exact same model that was used by Sabbath keeping churches back in the 50s and 60s. Same message, same methodology of delivering that false message of fear religion. If the Sabbath keeping community ever wants to get out of being a collection of bicyclists, we're going to have to do better in our evangelism. We've got to take the next step of being a collection of small bicyclists. Motorcycles. Motorcyclists. Yeah, we've got to go from being bicyclists, and then we can go on to be small motorcyclists, and then we can advance to be driving cars. 
That's what we've got to do, and we've got a long way to go. That's the lesson of Vietnam for the church today. And the even more important lesson, we've got to forgive. We've got to have love for one another. And we've got to get over it when people have done something to us in the past, and we've got to reconcile with our brother. We've just got to do it. Jesus says we've got We don't have any choice. We've got to do this. So it, it, please, let's, let's end the show by acknowledging I'm not suggesting that we have some great corporate reconciliation where we all come under, you know, the umbrella of one monolithic headquarters. No, no, no. I'm not talking about corporate reconciliation. I'm talking about brother-to-brother -brother, uh, reconciliation. That's what we need. Christianity is about relationships between people. It's not about loyalty to an organization. So please, reconcile with your brother. Do it before the Lord's Supper. Get it done. You need to do it. All right, Nancy, what have you got in the chat room for us tonight? All right, uh, Amy Her Howard said, if you don't forgive, you're holding a grudge. Vengeance only belongs to God. Forgive and let God uh, deal with with the sinner, only he has the power to change a wicked heart. Earlier, he, she said, you know, forgiveness is for yourself as well. Uh -huh. um, Larry Evans said, I've not seen such reconciliation yet between two of the Armstrong era churches. And Bill points out that uh, UCG and CGI are at least cooperating. And I'm going to give props <coughs> to CGI for that. CGI, I think, cooperates with other churches without asking okay. for anything back. Um, I... And some other churches, and I'm not saying UCG in particular, that they've cooperated with are more than happy to send a preacher over to their church or, you know, that type of thing, but not reciprocate. And then from what I've seen, CGI is good about CGI just con really good about continuing to, mm -hmm. to go ahead and help. And, and they're continually reaching out, you know, like the combined feast sites and things yeah. like that. With no strings attached. Right, right. And, and, and not saying, oh, if I give you this, what am I going to get in return? CGI does not do that. Let's make that very clear. Now, we won't talk about the other churches that are not that way because it would require naming names, and we don't need to do that tonight. Sure, sure. So we're just going to talk about the good and not um, yes. the negative side. Richard Maxwell says, if you have an um, ought against your brother, leave your gift at the altar and fix it. Uh, paraphrasing, and I, I think that's an important point we have to think about because this this reconciliation of brothers is so important to God. He doesn't. He's like, don't don't come worship me. Go fix it with your brother first. Like that is more important to the all powerful, almighty God who we're supposed to worship and adore. He is yeah. more concerned with you fixing things with your brother than any offering or gift you bring to him. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's even in the little things you got to forgive. I, I, I have a buddy, his name is Bez, he, um, and I was a youth leader in the local church, and he was one of my teenagers in my little youth group. And um, his parents had, had uh, gave him a couple chicks as pets, little chicks. And he raised them, and he loved them, and, he, and they grew up. And he came home from school one day, and they were having fried chicken. And after dinner, his mom told him, those are your two chickens oh, no. that you ate. And, and he was a little was kid, crushed. and he was furious. Okay, now, fast forward. That was like when he was six or seven years old. Fast forward to now he's 17 years old, and his mother and I were talking about it, and Ben says, and I'm still mad about that. <laughs> and his mom says, oh, it's such a shame that what's coming between you and the kingdom is a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought... Even in the a little great things, mom, yeah. yeah. Even in the little things, we've got to forgive. Even if we're mad that mom cooked our chicken, we've got to forgive that. You know. That's true. Um, Deb says. Deb Wilson says. Uh, even if you apologize, don't expect them to forgive you. And I think. I think we do have to address that. Some. We've been talking about uh, your responsibility to forgive others. We also have a responsibility. Um, as Richard also pointed out, to go and reconcile with our brother. But we we can go and apologize. We can um, forgive them for their side. We can do these things. Um, and that is our responsibility. We are not responsible for whether they forgive us or not. And if they don't, we should continue to pray for them to help them for their sakes to forgive. Okay. Let, let's make an important distinction. Whether or not you forgive that person is one issue. And whether or not that person forgives you is another issue. And at a certain point, they become separated. 
They're not linked at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Initially, they are. You go to the person. You ask him to forgive you because you've forgiven him. He says, no, I don't forgive you. Do you at that point say, well, then I don't forgive you? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you don't. Mm -hmm. At that point, once you have forgiven him, you've apologized, and he's made his stance of not forgiving you. It's now totally separate, no longer linked. Mm -hmm. you, you maintain that forgiveness that you had, even though he is being a really not nice person. Mm -hmm. Don't retaliate by saying, okay, then I don't forgive you, and then start the fight back over again. Al Bundy brings up a point. He says, uh, some don't forgive, but even hold sometimes someone's fault against them. So I think, oh, I read it differently at first, that uh, some people forgive, but then hold your faults against you, which well, that's not really forgiveness. Um, we... We are not God in that it is easy for us to, or, or something we can do to just forgive and completely forget. If you forgive someone, it is possible that your own thoughts or Satan will bring it up to you again. Mm -hmm. So we're, we, we don't have that luxury of just forgetting. But someone, they can't continue, they can't say they've forgiven you and continue to say, well, that, but, I, but, uh, but, but, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, what else you got in the chat room? Um, let's see. Uh, Marion Young Perkins says, We have so many brethren spread out through the world. I try to be in contact with as many as I can through social media. Amen. Um, and I think, uh, oh, Bill's mentioned something about people on unicycles. I'd be going backwards from bicycles. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> One wheeled bicycle. Okay. Um, I think uh, Marion brings up a good point. Um, one one way to to stay close to the brethren is through social media, and a good use of social media is is to connect with people. Yes, let's in a positive way. Yeah, and, let's and stay let's, in touch with people who maybe are remote or um, can't get to church, that type of thing. Yeah, let's use the internet for good because heaven knows the world is using the internet for all kind of evil stuff. I so can't tell you every good. day I see memes that just make me sad. Yeah. They're hateful. Yeah. Hateful memes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's 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 see. Uh, so uh, Tyrone Powell says, thank you for the message. You're welcome. Um, it was speaking to Tyrone. You know, we speak to ourselves too, Tyrone. Yep. <laughs> we Absolutely. do. Absolutely. It's something, it's, it's easy to talk about forgiveness. It's hard to do. I mean, I cannot imagine how I would react if my daughter was shot. Yeah. Right. So... Yeah, I, I hope that if that were to happen to a close relative of mine, I could be just like the Amish. Yeah. But I can't I can't sit here and say, oh, yeah, I'd be like the Amish. You don't know until you go I, through it. You, until you go through it, but I really hope that I can follow their example. I, I wanted to mention a uh, prayer request for Deb. I meant to do it earlier. She uh, has the potential for a job, and she's asking for prayers for a job. Deb Wilson? Mm -hmm. Okay, please add that to your prayer list. Deb Wilson, she's got the opportunity for a job. Please pray that Deb will get it. And add that to your India-Pakistan thing that those uh, crazy leaders over there that they don't cause a whole bunch of uh, collateral damage and innocent blood to be shed. So please pray about those things. Um, Amy makes another point that I think you're probably going to touch on in your segment about uh, being uh, taking the Passover unworthily. Mm -hmm. She says we should accept that we make mistakes and learn from it and forgive ourselves. And Amy, if you're anything like me, sometimes that's the harder part. You know, something can just gnaw at you. Uh, I talked about it a little bit uh, last week in my segment on regrets, you know, yeah. how something can continue to gnaw on you. We have to let it go because it weighs us down. You're carrying baggage with you that keeps you from moving forward. Um, and Robert, uh, Charlie says, is forgiveness complete where there is no more resentment? Um, I think, to me, forgiveness can be stages. So uh, you want to forgive someone, you, you trustingly, you know, you say, I forgive you. But um, sometimes you have to forgive again. You know, it's brought back up or the feelings don't go away, especially if it's something, you know, horrible like a murder or, or something yeah. like that. You, you probably have to forgive again. You've got to let go again. And we've got to keep repenting of that lack of forgiveness because mm -hmm. everyone's, after we forgive, a lot of times, the forgiveness will go away. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to push that back down, bear, mm -hmm. like burying the old man in the grave. Get that old man back mm -hmm. down in there. and Because sometimes it's not easy, some things mm -hmm. that have been done to us. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we've got the share uh, thing up. So please um, uh, remember to share this, if you would, please. Um, and if you don't, uh, we understand. But if uh, you get benefit from this show, please share. Okay. 
I love to. Uh, Mamie says, I love to connect with so many people all over the world. It does help me from being so lonely. So when, uh, uh, Mimi, when you're helping others, you're helping yourself. And that's what um, helping is all about. When we give to others, we're not just giving to them, we're giving to ourselves. Okay, that's great. So should we wrap this up? Yeah, let's wrap this up and call it. Well, we're not on time. We're I 10 said minutes. close. I said we're close. Oh, close. We've been a lot here. further off time <laughs> Yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, come back next week because, um, <coughs> excuse me, praise God, the technical stuff worked two weeks in a row. Isn't this wonderful? So can let's... You move the mic so when you hit the table, it oh, doesn't hit the mic. Oh, nobody complained that I no, can. I okay, so I can hit the table now, okay? I can bang and, and set the cup down hard and nobody's going to get mad. <laughs> By the way... <coughs> <coughs> and so anyway, before I have a coffin fit, let's end this. Okay. And come back next week because right. God willing, uh, the technical stuff will work and we'll be here. And then a week from tomorrow, we'll give the first sermon here uh, for the RLDEA. <laughs> so they get Friday night and Saturday, huh? Uh, yeah, so they're going to have to put up with us uh, Friday night. And something that I didn't mention earlier that we need to mention is <coughs> after Wesley's sermon, there'll be Q&A. Yes. So you don't have to call in, but you can write to us in the chat room. We'll, we'll answer your question. We'll read them out loud. We'll answer your questions. You can answer each other's questions in the chat room and just have this interactive discussion. So Wes is not going to just lay a sermon on you and walk away. That's right. Uh, he's going to give you time to chat. Yeah, and give you a chance to challenge me because I, I don't always get it perfect. I may, may make a mistake. I may omit something that needs, uh, you know, addition. I may say something that needs clarification. So um, I'm not perfect. I don't, I've never given a perfect sermon in my entire life. So um, no problem if you want to take okay. exception. We always encourage that. Okay, so uh, we've asked you to share, uh -huh. and I think we're going to uh, do away with the closing prayer tonight because um, I'm having a coughing fit, okay. and I'm sucking on a cough drop. So Please close uh, it out with prayer at home. Yeah, so pray at home. Pray for um, uh, uh, Deb Wilson uh, her for job. her job. Mm -hmm. Pray for India uh, and, and Pakistan. And, and, and the um, leaders will have oh, good and, sense. And, and next week we're, we need to talk about... Um, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, 28, I think. I should have looked it up before I got here. Anyway, about taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. We need okay. to talk about that next and Just week. one final thing. It seems like our two presentations uh, kind of went together. We're talking about... Yes, um, very you know, nice. Not holding things against yeah. people. Not letting things separate you. Richard Maxwell says, what time is it? It will be a week from tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central Time. <laughs> oh, so, and Amy said that in there. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Appreciate it. And Wes is not perfect. Amy wants to know. Question mark. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not either. So, a Amy, you had to ask that question, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Amy. We'll okay. talk later. <laughs> we'll talk later. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's well, so we're not going to close down. with no prayer. So prayer. we're just going to say just, goodbye and, and have, have a good Sabbath. Sabbath. Thanks for being with see us. Next it was, week. It was our privilege to serve you. All right. Let's see if we can shut this down and post it.